Hey, Jim Hoffman here for EMS Office Hours at emsseo.com. Uh, thanks for joining me for this quick video here where I'm joined by Chris Sobolero, and we're going to talk a little bit about some of Chris's favorite things that he saw in 2017 and what he wants to see more of in 2018. Uh, before we get there, guys, I do have a quick freebie for you. Um, got a free multi-tool here that uh, you can pick up over on the website is at emsseo.com forward slash mt for multi-tool. Um, this is a pretty cool tool here, guys, and uh, offered by some friends of mine that are online, and they're offering this. They have limited stock in this, of course, and they're offering it for free. So uh, go check it out. Uh, there'll be a link below in the notes. You can go ahead and directly get to the page to claim this free tool. I believe you've got to pay a small shipping and handling fee. But other than that, the tool itself is free. So a real good value, I think, uh, something that I think we can use out there in the field as well. So let me go ahead and end this here, guys, and we will go ahead and join uh, myself and Chris in this quick video. Hey, everybody. Jim Hoffman here from EMS SEO. I am joined by Chris Selbolero. Is that you say your name? You said it good. All right. Okay. Great. Um, going to go over again uh, just some of Chris's thoughts on 2017 in EMS and uh, what he kind of maybe learned or, or sort of discovered over the years, over this past year, and what he's going to kind of bring it to 2018. Um, Chris, uh, thanks for joining me, of course. Okay. Um, if, before we get started, you want to maybe just tell a little bit about yourself just so people that might not have heard of you, you know, they can get a little idea about just what you're all about and stuff. Sure, sure. So I've been a paramedic since the Reagan administration, so I've been around a long time. And, uh, you know, I was, uh, you know, I worked at MedStar in Fort Worth, Texas. I worked up in the Northeast for a while, uh, became there. I uh, was a paramedic there, became an FTO at MedStar, uh, clinical coordinator, and I was a clinical services director, spent about 10 years there. And then I went to uh, uh, St. Louis and became the chief of EMS up there at Christian Hospital in North St. Louis County. You know, I tried to really kind of grow my career. You know, we, we have a career gym that is really still in the pioneering stage. I mean, modern day EMS is really just 50, just over 50 years old. Well, I'm just over 50 years old, so that's not very old, you know. And uh, I think there's a lot of pioneering. So I've tried to become an author, a speaker. Uh, I've had the opportunity to sit on some national committees and uh, really kind of help the career, pardon me, really kind of help the career field move forward and uh, bring us into the next generation of emergency medical services. Right. I know you're doing a lot of leadership stuff now as well. I've noted, uh, you know, what you're doing with that, and that's pretty cool. And hopefully people are taking advantage of that that aspect of what you're growing into as well. Um, so I asked you to join me today. I just kind of I want to get your kind of thoughts and on two things, maybe three things, and what you think, uh, you know, in 2017 you want to kind of bring in and what you think might move us a little forward coming over the next year. Yeah, so I think that 2017 was a very interesting year. I mean, one of the things that has been happening over the past few years is the transition to the MIHCP, Mobile Integrated Healthcare Community Paramedicine environment. Mm -hmm. And now when we start to think about that, you know, that really kind of started to happen in 2008, 2009, and then has grown. I think what 2017 did was really kind of bring in the final phase. So if the first phase of this was how do we develop a program and how do we train our paramedics? And then the second phase was, you know, now that we have this program, who, what kind of patients do we take care of and what do we do for them? And then finally, I think this third phase is where 2017 brought us was how do we pay for it? How do we get reimbursement for it? So I think the big news that comes out of this transition of 2017 is now the payment for the community paramedicine mobile integrated healthcare model. And I think that as a career field, we now need to carry this into 2018 and eventually to 2020 because we're almost to a point where uh, we're going to lose the reimbursement that we're getting from yeah. CMS for the work that we're doing. You know, uh, even though that EMS is only 1% of the Medicare budget, you know, we, we're responsible for a, a big amount of downstream revenue because we're taking people to the hospital that don't need to go because that's the only way that we get reimbursed. And then, of course, the hospitals are doing their thing on their end. So it's only a matter of time before we start to see the same cuts that our hospital partners are seeing, that our home health agencies are seeing, that the, you know, uh, primary care physicians are seeing. And we've got to be proactive in this process, Jim. 
Yeah. Well, I, I, just to kind of uh, point out with that, I know where I am, they run the, one of the hospitals run a very uh, aggressive community paramedicine program and uh, to talk about reimbursement and, and they are speaking to a couple of the medics there that do that. And they were talking about how that, that it's saving the hospital like millions of dollars. Yeah. So, you know, even if it's not getting reimbursed, they're kind of still saving money by running the program. You know, so I think that one of the things that we have to think about, Jim, is we've got to end our dependency on CMS. We think that CMS is the goose that laid the golden egg, and it really isn't. You know, we send the $1,500 bill out the door, and we get $421 in, in reimbursement back. And as you eloquently said, Jim, hospital systems are saving millions and millions of dollars. We got to stop thinking about this as a Medicare reimbursement and start to think about this as a business line. And we don't have that knowledge as EMS providers, as EMS leaders. And think about it as a new business line of how do we get this reimbursement? We go to the hospital partners who are saving the millions of dollars and share in that cost savings. We go to the insurance companies and we say, we can make a difference. We can help you save money. We can keep your high utilized out of the hospital. Come in and be partners with us. We go to the accountable care organizations and we say, we can make a difference for your patients. And then this is where that money needs to come from. There is millions and millions of dollars out there. Right. And we just have to be able to put our hands on it and stop thinking it's coming from the federal government. Yeah, that's a great point, sir. And it, it, you talk to people, and some people are kind of for this, the community paramedicine, some people are against it. And I think it's a lot of it because of what you said. It, it's people don't feel that, that, that there's no money in it. So right. agencies are not going to embrace it because there's not money in it. They're already struggling just keeping regular ambulances out there on the street, keeping people you know, staffed and, and responding to the calls. And now you're asking them to take on another, you know, entity that there's no guaranteed, you know, revenue coming from it. Yeah, that, but I think that goes back to the way that we've we've run our businesses for so long, you know. Again, we submit a code to the government and they give us a check. Yeah. We've got to learn the business side of running a business. And we don't think of EMS as a business. We think about it as a service. We think about ourselves as providers. But now we have the opportunity to develop this new environment and turn it into a business. And the money is out there. We've just got to learn the education of how to sit at the table and how to negotiate right. get this money into our systems. And that's where this education is now. So first phase was growing a program. Second phase was how do we help people? Third phase is where does the money come from? And I think we're starting to see that now. There's a lot of insurance companies, Jim, that are starting to do pilots. Uh, you know, this big thing where uh, uh, CVS just bought Aetna. I mean, these are going to be, you're going to have a one-stop shop. You're going to be able to go into CVS. You're going to be able to see a doctor. You're going to be able to get your medicine. You're going to be able to go home. Well, is there a opportunity for mobile integrated healthcare and community paramedics to partner with somebody like CVS to say, um, how can we help you keep these patients out of the hospital? Yeah. Secondarily, I think it's a matter of time before Walgreens, and actually I thought Walmart was going to be first in this process, and before you see, start to see them into the same process of uh, buying these insurance companies, and I think we're really on the cusp of some really challenge, uh, really opportunistic times as we move into the next couple years. Yeah, I definitely agree with you. Um, <laughs> so anything else, you, anything that you kind of envision, anything else you're seeing? for the upcoming year or what anything you saw in 2017 that kind of stuff stood out for you you know i think that we're starting to see a lot more of and if we just go back to our just our regular business i think we're seeing a lot more opportunities to really kind of utilize the skills as ems providers you know the discussion now is starting to move around giving our bls partners a little bit more responsibility you know can we get to a day jim where ems i'm sorry emts are the primary uh, uh, providers that are running 911 calls. We'll go back to the days of ALS Intercept and have these community paramedics or critical care paramedics in fly cars. Because when we think about the work that we're doing, how much of that is truly emergency work? Sure. And can we now start to think about our EMT partners, giving them some expanded scope of practice, letting them run those calls with ALS Intercept? Because as we now start to transition, into this, into this mobile integrated healthcare community paramedicine space, 
Um, I think that there's a lot more work that we can do and be a lot more um, uh, resourceful with the uh, providers that we have on the street. Yeah, and that's, another, that's one of those things, too. You see the argument with that also where you have some people who say, well, let's just make everybody ALS, and that's they respond to everything, and they're ready to handle whatever it is that comes their way. And then, like you said, then other people argue, well, that we should have just EMTs, put the paramedics in fly cars, so they handle the calls that are actual emergent, the actual STEMIs, the actual you know stuff where they can use the skills that they're trained to do. Right. So very, very... Yeah, Again, it's both sides of that coin, and it's, you're kind of fighting. It always seems to be fighting it. You know, you see it all the time in social media, and you see it uh, constantly. So it's just one of those things, I guess. I, you know, we always seem to be kind of in the weeds, kind of figuring that, trying to figure that stuff out. And it's, you know, sometimes it gets it's frustrating for people. And then people kind of give up and say, well, I'll just do what I have to do to get by. You know, I think that that's where the fun and the excitement is in the career field, though, Jim, is that you want to have both sides of the argument. Just because I give you my side doesn't necessarily mean it's right. I mean, I can go ahead and say we need to use BLS providers on the street. But then when I go ahead and prove it, come to find out that I was screwing the pooch on it. So but I think that when you have both sides of the argument, you need to be able to prove both sides of the argument as to which is better. I mean, we just can't have this, as you're saying. We've yeah. got to have documented proof that it works or it doesn't work. And that's one thing in EMS that we don't have is a lot of science behind the things that we do and if we're truly uh, making a difference in our field. Yeah, it's true because you get people who sort of see it from there. I guess their sort of uh, little fishbowl where they are, how they see it working and what they feel is better versus, you know, having intercept versus having fully staffed, you know, medic right. I actually just, I did a, one of these episodes with Brian Fast and talking about wellness for, EM, for EMTs and stuff too. And it's the same type of thing where, well, we don't really need that. We've been doing without for so long. Why are we bring this into the, you know, the, the greatest scope of what we're doing? So yeah. it's true. You have to kind of take, take that step back. And I find myself doing it all the time where I'm kind of locked into my, my own world and what I'm doing as a provider. And I got to kind of take a step back and then kind of say, okay, well, what am I, what is it that I'm really trying to get at? You know? So it is very true. Well, um, Chris, thanks a lot, man, for joining me. I really appreciate it. I hope you feel better. Thank you, Jim. Is there a website or a social media tag you want to put out there if anyone want to find yeah, out? Yeah, sure. Go ahead, and, uh, go ahead and check out my uh, my Facebook page, Subalero and Associates. A lot of great leadership stuff on there. And check out the uh, Ultimate Leadership Podcast if you guys want some leadership stuff. And uh, I just want to say happy holidays to everybody, and let's have a great 2018 and truly bring the career field forward and uh, bring it into the next generation. All right. Great, Chris. I appreciate it. Have a great week. Thank you, Jim. Bye-bye. Uh,